Yo, 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 what's poppin'? You kicking it with the coldest podcast in the world. I'm your boy, B. Jones, a.k.a. Bolo, and you know when I'm pulling up to the porch. I can't pull up without my dog. What's going on, y'all? It's your boy, Big Smitty, a.k.a. D-Nice. And where we at again, Bolo? Y'all know we in the place to be, so tell a friend to tell a friend to grab a drink, because this is The, the porch. porch. Started on the porch, that was where it all began. Had to put in work, every day we got it in. Chased all our dreams and now they can't believe it. We make it look easy. We achieving everything we need. Now we undefeated. If we link, no, it's only business. If we get to speak and leave them speechless. I did things for free, but now it costs to see me. When you see me, you ain't gotta greet me. Just don't plot to sneak me. I'ma see it. I'ma stop and watch you lose and get defeated. What's hey. going on, man? How you doing? I'm good. I'm excited, man. It's the new year, new goals. Just, you know. Trying to start off the year right. How you doing? Hey, same old, same old, man. You know, the grind don't stop. Living out here in L.A., man, you got to just keep on going and going if you want to stay afloat. <laughs> I, yeah, I, hey, I got it. Look, the city of dreams. You, gotta, yes, you better sir. chase your dreams or somebody else going to chase them, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, we've been waiting all week for you know this what? guest right here, so I, I can't keep the people waiting. This She really doesn't even need an intro. You probably already seen her, but I'm going to give her one anyway. Uh, big time guest on the porch right now. She has over a decade of experience on TV. You might have seen her hosting shows on Fox Sports, sideline reporting the NBA playoffs, or working on air on CBS. She's a two time Emmy winning TV broadcaster, the legendary Jamie Maggio. Welcome to the porch. Oh, guys, thank you so much for having me. That was a great intro. I got to take Absolutely. you out with me more often. Yeah, I got you. I got you anytime, man. We okay. always got to show love when you come to the porch. So we appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me on. Yes, of course. Of course. So um, a lot of our listeners are going to be watching, and, and I'm sure some of your fans as well are going to be curious to know just how Jamie Maggio got to where you are today. So I just want to start from the early years, from the beginning. So obviously, big time sports broadcaster and TV reporter. When you were a kid, tell us how or when that love for sports first came came about oh man um honestly like since i was a little kid um i grew up in new york whole family was into sports um bit of sports gambling as well going around in the family and it was just something i was exposed to at an early age and i don't think when i was that young i really understood x's and o's or strategies but i saw how it brought people together and the excitement that you know it filled the living room with and you're yelling at the tv and you're cheering and you're happy and it was just it was that sort of environment that that drew me in it was something really like the whole family did um right. so was like participate or be an outsider so. <laughs> <laughs> almost didn't have a choice it's like you want to be a part of this family you're going to like sports <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my grandfather got all like the newspapers all the so he'd sit mm -hmm. at the table and read the sports pages and i would sit with him and read with him and you know so it was just being exposed to it and i think in new york too i mean I, I'm, I'm not gonna do the east coast bias thing but it's such a great city for sport right. you know there's there's right. so much and there's so much success with the team so um it was easy to kind of get sucked in at at a really early age no for sure now was there like a um i know you mentioned the family used to get together was it like any like family favorites in like new york teams at all like the mets or the yankees or you uh, know just question. kind of those teams at all you know it, it's um it was primarily giants and mm. mets Okay. But then there'd be a few that were Jets um, or Yankees. And mm. so that, you know, it creates like the household a little bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> divided in, uh, situation. So and I'll, I'll be honest, and you guys are going to throw me under the bus for this one. But it was actually the Mets that that I was into when I first got into sports. Um, okay off that 86 uh, World Series championship that was mm -hmm. like the hype of they were the toast of New York but then as I got a little bit older and I started to learn the history of right. the franchises I, I jumped on the Yankees bandwagon so it's all good I mean most people have jumped on the Yankees bandwagon so you're not the only one <laughs> including, including myself I think I'm a I'm a Yankees fan just Are you in New fall. York no, no. So I'm originally from Chicago, but oh, okay. I just grew up in Little League playing baseball and you know watching you know um Alfonso Soriano and you know yeah. just kind of those those guys when they play for the Yankees of course Derek Jeter um yeah. so I just kind of grew up just you know liking them in the Orioles um the most out of you know the MLB teams growing up yeah. so 
And when the, when the core four of the Yankees uh, retired, I have dropped off in my fandom a little bit. Plus, you know, you work in sports, you get, right. it's right. just, you have less time to watch everything or you're watching games because it's your job. And so the, the, the Yankee fandom has tapered off a little bit, but that is still my, my number one team. No. Got you. Got you. So you talked about it. Obviously, you born and raised originally in uh, Long Island, New York. Um, Long Island? What? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I need to get a, I need to get a Long Island while we on the porch. But uh, <laughs> explain like you always hear that the East Coast is like super competitive, whether it's music, sports, whatever. I, take me back to like nine year old, like young Jamie Maggio. Were you a super competitive kid? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I, I thought I was tough. I remember like, yes, I mean, I was, I think, <laughs> I, think I think everybody is right. Like you, right. you generally are right. You play sports, you want to compete. I, I wanted to compete academically in school. It was like, right. I don't know where that comes from, but yeah, I, I, I was competitive in a lot, <laughs> in a lot of fields. Yeah. No, nah, I, I don't know. I have a few teammates in college and just friends and people I've met where they're from like the East Coast, whether it's Jersey or New York. And like, I don't know what it is. It's like a certain vibe about Keep it on your shoulder kind of thing. Yeah. Like you just a different energy. It's like, okay, you got to just be on the lookout a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I probably take that into therapy. Competitive <laughs> she was a young child at everything she did. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. No, exactly. So, so I mean, how was it in general just growing up in New York? I, New York, I mean, listen, I've been now on the West Coast for longer than I have lived on the East Coast, but my entire family is still in New York. I, mm. I have nothing but love for New York. Um, again, like, I feel like there's, like, a, I, I was in the suburbs, like, I didn't grow up in the city, mm-hmm. but I feel yeah. like maybe there's a little bit of a grittiness that comes there. And and I don't know, you 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 deal with the elements, right? Like the, the right. weather, and there's like, there is like a toughness. And I think New Yorkers get a bad rap for being um, rough around the edges. I just think it's like a way right. of life. But when it comes down to it, New Yorkers will be the first one to take their shirt off their back or, or mm. let the hand to a neighbor and, and lift someone up. So um, that growing up in New York, it, it was a fun environment. I enjoyed like, I mean, listen, those were the days where like you could you could play in the street and right. you know like, <laughs> time to change games it was like it was yeah times have changed but uh but i i do like the west coast lifestyle I, i'm not gonna lie i i enjoy the sunshine and the more moderate temperatures absolutely amen is, is, is am i soft did i basically just say that i'm soft oh no, no you're just oh, real no, no. L- yeah listen like, you said you said Long Island, you know that. I mean that, that that alone just just comes with some with some cred. Like okay, Jamie got it. She's from Long <laughs> Island. All right, it's not a game. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for sure. And I'm I'm originally from Indianapolis. Obviously, you know Brian said he's from Chicago. So I grew up in snow, having seasons. Yeah. So being out in LA for about four years now, I'm in love. It's like a whole nother world. It's like I, listen, I love Indianapolis, but I'm not planning on going back <laughs> how do you deal with the cold weather now like do you enjoy going to the snow or go to the mountains or are you like f that i'm done with it it's like certain at certain moment like for christmas right i i yeah. like seeing right. snow on christmas day you know right. what i'm saying i'm used to growing up it makes it more feel like more of a holiday but like give me two days of it and i'm ready to come back to the west coast like i don't need long stints of being out in the cold anymore I I so, I'm je- so i'm jealous i have to ask because I, I live in indianapolis now it's currently 21 degrees Ooh. and the wind is just kicking. So it probably feels about eight outside right now. What's the weather right now in LA? Uh, it's probably what? Oh my, yeah, 70 probably. On. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't and think I've seen the sun in like four days. Um, the Christmas tree is coming down this week, I swear. Oh, I have mine up too. If I could turn the laptop, mine is still over here in the corner lit up. I just so. took down my Christmas stuff today. So no, no, no hard. No judgment. Me. I got to dedicate like two, three hours to doing it. So I haven't, I haven't found the time yet. Right. But so, yeah, it was a nice day. It was a beautiful day. But guess what, Brian? We had a lot of rain recently. We are okay. climbing out of our drought, which is big for us here in South right, California. Right. So, it's been uh, pouring down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but uh, today was a good day. Yes. So obviously you're in LA now and, and you transitioned, uh, made that move when you're in high school. And it's funny, I have a buddy of mine um, played with Darnell and I at Ball State. He's one of the coaches for the New York uh, Jets. 
So <laughs> he, he currently lives in New Jersey and he's a Chicago guy. And obviously Chicago's fast paced too, almost ha has a similar vibe to New Jersey and New York just a bit, but you know, just kind of picking up his his vibe and asking him questions about the East Coast. He's like, yeah, it's different. He's like from like the salesman, from the people walking on the street, like everything's fast paced. Like people want it when they want it now, like everything's efficient and moving fast and things like that. I guess when you transition to LA, I guess, did any part of like that New York, Long Island feel, you know, translate over to LA and, and give you a, a, hit, a hand up in the, in the game at all? You know, that's a, that's a great question. No one has ever asked me that, but it is something that I do think is a thing. I think that, mm -hmm. you know, New Yorkers, and I want to go back to the fact that you loop in New Jersey with New York, because any New Yorker is going to be offended by that, okay? Ooh, okay, okay. Different thing. Okay, okay. Oh, so I might, have, might have edited edit that one out. No, no seriously. Um, but I, I do think that, that New Yorkers move with purpose and with intention and with their, you know, efficient. And so mm -hmm. I, I remember actually when I, when I first started um, in the business at Fox Sports, there, there was a producer that said, you know, I, I prefer to have everybody on my crew be from the East Coast because they just, you know, they get it. They, they have their move with a sense of urgency and they, they get it with the timeline and getting things done. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, and it's, it sort of was buried in the back of my brain until you just brought it up. Um, but I do, I do think there is something to be said, you know, about that, about like just having a sense of urgency and a sense of purpose that is a little bit more lackadaisical on the West coast. Yeah. You know what I mean? Everyone's, everyone's, it's the water, everyone's hanging around, you know, there, there's certain things legal out here that, you know, could lead to, uh, <laughs> some hanging around and chill legal in new york though right right yeah, true yeah soon it'll be legal everywhere but right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so talk about that transition i mean you came out here i believe when you were 19 i believe no i came out i, I came out right before high school so i was like Ooh. yeah 13 it was that awkward that was yeah. awkward. how tough was that transition because i'm sure all your friends and families right. back on the east coast and to move at that point in your life as a young lady figuring out stuff figuring out just life and yeah. how tough was that moment for you it was, it was, uh, it was funny. I, you know, again, New York, I, I, I felt you, okay. 13 is an interesting age, right? Like right. You, you feel like you're, you're trying to become, you know, who you are and you have this independence, whatever. And then I, you move into like a completely new environment where you, you have no clout, like any clout <laughs> that you've built up in your 13 year old self, you know, it does yeah. not transfer Amazing. across the country. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of a transition making friends and, and figuring things out. And I definitely had a bit of a, more of a tomboy vibe, I think with my New York crew. And then when I moved to, out to California, I was definitely, you know, more girly girl. I was, I was moving into a Catholic school and it was just a different scene. Right. Um, but, you know, I think also like kids at that age are super adaptable. Sure. Um, so it was, you know, I just had to figure it out a little bit and, and you know, pay more attention to like <laughs> how to dress and, you know, uh, lose the New York accent for sure. Or for sure, as you would say. <laughs> oh, I like that. You still got it. You still got it. Oh, I can still get into it. Yeah. I, I die now. I tell my mom, like, mom, it's just read the words as, as they are written, as they are spelled, you know? Yeah. But it's New Yorkers, it's funny because you, if, it, if a word ends in R, mm -hmm. you make it into an A. Like, mm. like never would be never. Right. But if a word is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a little, you sound a little Boston right there. Yeah, I'd be in my fault. <laughs> if a word ends in an A, my mom adds an R. Oh. So I have a niece named Ava that she calls Aver. Where's Aver? I'm like, mom, it's Ava, just like it's spelled. Mm -hmm. I have an Aunt Linda. She says Aunt Linda. I'm trying to think of like other A examples, but it's it's like an A R thing that's uh -huh. that's super funny. weird, super weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's, I, like I had it. no idea before I did like the research for this show that you were even from the East Coast because like yeah. you really don't hear it in your day to day. Like when you're working, this you've done a great job of just I, I guess masking it or I don't know how no, how you I, did it. At this point, it's gone. I could just I could tap into it because I. I talk to the family all the time, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it doesn't really translate well on TV. Like other than like Stephen A. Smith and Linda Cohen, I right. can't really think of any 
broadcasters, especially at a national level, that have an accent, mm. East Coast accent. Right. What do you, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I'm thinking. Um, I think you're right. I mean, <laughs> other than those two, Stephen A. Smith, and yeah, I don't think there's any other big, like big time people right. yet anyway w- yeah. with that East Coast accent. So is that something when you were, obviously you were young, you know, and you knew you wanted to get into that industry, like did someone tell you that or is that something that you just kind of saw on your own and knew you had to change it? to get made fun of in high school. <laughs> right. And people come over and they're like, say talk, say dog, say coffee. And I'm like, Jesus. And kids, I, I was just telling on our, one of our last episodes, like kids are mean, especially like in high school and like they just, they come right from the hip. They're going to let you know how they feeling, when they yes. feeling it. And if any feeling in your body, if you got any left, they going to pretty sure try to rip that out of you. So yeah. It's, right, it's crazy. Yeah, kids are brutal. Kids Man. are brutal. I always grew up the bigger guy, so trust me, I <laughs> I got my fair share of, of, the, of the jokes. But yeah, you got um, some funny nicknames growing up. You said what? You got some funny nicknames growing up. Man, what did they call me growing up? I'm trying to think real quick. I can't. My well, when, once I got to high school, you know, people would call me just this is a basic name. They call me Big Smitty because I was just always a bigger guy, last name Smith, kind of simple. So. Big Smitty. When I was real young, they called me D Money. I don't know. I don't know where that came from. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, definitely got my fair share of uh, you know kids clowning. But that, that's just how it is. So um, obviously, so yeah, let's transition to to school. Um, you ended up going to what University of California, uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, take us back to the you know college, uh, Jamie Maggio. What was that experience like for you? I don't remember. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you might not remember because, you know, we were all that party and turning up. All I know is my dad was like, you better do this in four years. Cause there was a lot of people at that school on like the five and six year program. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, it, was a, it was a good time. It was a good time. I didn't realize at the time that the communications program at that school wasn't necessarily geared towards broadcast communications. It was mm-hmm. more theoretical communications. So people are like, Oh, you're, you know, you're in broadcasting where you a communications major. And I say, yes, but it, the college part like didn't really apply to what I do now. But yeah, Santa Barbara was awesome. And um, at that time, like our big claim to fame, probably still, uh, Brian Shaw. Yeah. B. Um, Shaw went to UCSB mm-hmm. and Jim Rome. God, oh, yeah. I didn't know Jim Rome went there. Yeah. So yeah, so Jim oh. Rome, when I was in school, had the, a radio show that I would listen to. And I was like, oh, this guy's amazing. And he was a gaucho. So that, uh, that was like, you know, in school, I would listen to his show and think like, that's pretty cool. But it, I didn't really know how to get to into this business it wasn't an easy yeah i i i I feel like most people don't like it yeah (laughs) i don't know it's it's, i know it's it's, i feel like there's not one route that just like if you do this this and this you'll make it it's like uh not necessarily the thing that you do have to do is just be persistent persistent and professional i think Mm -hmm. is is the key to success in this business because a lot of doors are going to close in your face i remember i had a boss early on in my career, who was pretty high up um, at a regional network. Mm -hmm. And he told me that I had a whiny voice and a baby face and actually suggested that I do Playboy if I wanted to launch my career. What? Wow. Real. This was my boss. Stop playing, Jamie. I swear to God. And I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) I just walked out of there and I'm like, holy shit, that just happened. Whiny voice, baby face. And I should take my clothes off if I wanted to be taken seriously. Yeah. I know like at that age, you know, you're figuring stuff out. Like in that, I mean, I was, you look back now, we laugh now, but in that moment, I'm sure you were like, the what the hell? I'm surprised like, in your research, you didn't find the Playboy spread. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I, I was like, did you? <laughs> Let me go to Google. Let me pull, let's find it. <laughs> Man. Well, yeah. I, I guess that, that, that leads to the question where a lot of people in the industry doing that to, to get uh-huh. to the TV or at that at that time? <laughs> You know, there was a couple, there was a couple. And, and I think at, at that time period, well, Playboy was a big thing and right. Maxim and FHM. So you had all of these, you know, men's magazines that kind of like tailored toward that. And, and, and no knock on it. Like, yeah. I, I just figured, you know, it, that wasn't really the, the route I wanted to go. But um, but that it just seemed to be like pretty, that was a, a big thing at the time. So, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do that. 
you would think a baby face would be like a compliment. Like if you're looking right. back, that's a good thing, right? Now <laughs> that's good skin. I mean, you look young. That's a compliment, in my opinion, right, Bolo? Absolutely. I mean, you had chubbier cheeks at the time. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and I did take voice lessons once, actually. Um, early in my career, but um, I don't, I, you know, I just think if you have it, you have it. It's yeah. not, it's not something that you can fake. It's not something that you can force. It, it would drive me crazy when people would say like, do you really like sports? I'm like, are you kidding me? Like you cannot work in this business, even if you're behind the scenes, like you can't yeah. work in this business unless you are passionate about it. And you can't, you can't start studying today. You have to grow up with it. You have right. to have watched the generations before you became a professional so that you understand the history. And, you know, there, you can't just become a sports fan overnight. 100%. 100%. I get it. And, yeah. it's, and it's one of those things too, especially like, like you mentioned a little bit earlier, like I think people who grow up, you know, watching the game and become analysts, not only do they know like the personnel, they know people need to be successful, but they also know the schematics too. Mm -hmm. Like they know different pieces that you can put in place for a team to be successful, right? So I think one cool thing about just analysts and things like that, like my, my wife, so I've been, I've been with my wife for a little while now and she was like total like anti-football and like I'm a football geek. Like I just geek out sure. over the small things of football, like positioning and what the this person did wrong and gaps and stuff like that and yeah. it's funny to just kind of coach her up and, and show her like hey this person you know hit the wrong gap so that's why they you know hit the b gap and ran for 35 yards right so <laughs> just different things like that just educating and like you hear some analysts you know when they're you know calling the game they're like coaching us up like they're making us understand so it gives us a more of an in-game feeling of like we right. know what's going on we feel like we're actually on the sideline yeah, you um, want to yeah. learn something when you're listening. That's why I hate watching a game at a bar. If it's an yeah. important game, I need to be at home in my living room because I want to listen to the broadcast. Did, by the way, is your wife warming up to football? That's yes, she is warming up to football. So I met her at Ball State. Um, we started dating chirp, chirp. Um, like my junior year. And she started to, that's kind of when she started to get introduced to it because she would come to the football games and stuff. Yeah. But, um, you know, as our relationship grew and football was over and football was there, you know, college football. So, you know, it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, <laughs> Monday. So, you know, my TV is literally locked on football. So she had no choice, you know, um, either to go upstairs or she wanted to spend some time with Brian, you know, right, we could right. just watch some football. So let me tell you, though, instead of telling her about the B gap, you <laughs> should break down the personal stories, because that's Ooh. what I think. Like that. women when they understand that like this guy i mean alex smith for example like what a great story that is when you Absolutely. start to explain some of the personal stories of these players they get to the emotional ties i think that is you know part of what the female audience can appreciate i think so too it's funny too because she like oh who's that guy like he's cool like i'm gonna look him up on instagram i'm like oh okay she, oh, he, he has a pretty wife oh my god he's hot. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> don't look too hard now <laughs> So yeah, it, it keeps them it keeps them engaged, and um, I'm just happy that you know, like I said, she she knows about the game, and it's fun yeah. to just have a have a conversation just about you know football and things like that. And obviously, you know, it's a give and take thing. So you know, I, I'll watch a few shows here and there, and you know, we'll we'll have some dialogue about a few shows that she loves to watch as well. So that's in, nice. Insecure I at home watching Insecure. Insecure is a good show. You gotta love. Oh it. yeah, I watch love it for it. sure. Yeah, love season finale. Yes. <laughs> I used to meet a guy who was obsessed with um, The Walking Dead. Uh -huh. and I, I cannot watch it. I like the gore just grosses me out. But mm. I would read these recaps the next day so that I could talk to him a little <laughs> bit about the show because he loved it so much. But I, even sometimes the recaps would be like a, a gif or gif, however you say it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, like a zombie ripping someone's head off. And I was like, I could never get into it. Like, I I mean, it was a very successful show. I couldn't get into it. I didn't do Game of Thrones either. Not me either. Thank, we're on the same page. I, I seen probably 10 minutes of the first episode and I was like done with it. Like, Which one? Like, Which one? Game of Thrones? It was like the very first episode. Like somebody like, like, I, it was just so weird to me. Like they were in like uh, the woods and somebody was fighting. They had like a fight and then somebody fell out of a window. Uh -huh. it was just, it was Too much going on. <laughs> And then, like, I hate when, like, it's, like, those type of shows and you're so far behind. And it's, like, uh, at this point, I don't know if I want to just sit here and watch. What is it, like, six seasons now? 
I don't even know. You got to get exactly. like knocked so, out with COVID if you're going to catch up on anything. Like exactly. That. 100%. 100%. <laughs> 100%. So let's, oh, let's transition to the beginning of your career. You talked about it a little bit. You start off at uh, Fox News, I believe, as a, what, an operations assistant. Yep. Walk us through, because like I think people watch, you know, people like yourself and other or sports reporters and analysts, and they just think, oh, anyone can go on TV and just talk. And, and it's like, listen, y'all don't understand the grind, the work it, it took to even get to that point, let alone to do your current job. So mm-hmm. kind of walk us through the journey that it took for you to get to the beginning as a as an assistant to who you are today. Yeah, I, I um, and I even got so lucky when I got that job as an operations assistant. I had been at a wedding with some friends in San Diego and at my table was um, this guy and girl who are now married, but they were dating then. And she Mm -hmm. was a reporter in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And he was on the assignment desk at Fox Sports and, or like assignment desk manager. And I'm like, oh, you guys are living my dream. Like, I don't, you know, I don't know how to get a foot in the industry. At the time I was like right out of college and I was working at Forbes magazine doing advertising sales. And, um, the guy ended up saying, um, we exchanged information and I maybe like six months went by and, and he reached out and he's like, Hey, a job opened. Um, it's not what you want to do, but it's a foot in the door in the business. And you know, it's in the operations department and, but it's sports and broadcasting. So I took the job and I would also advise anyone getting into the business. Like if you have an opportunity to get the exposure, take it. Yes. And don't, don't sit back and, and wait. Sometimes you just have to like carve it out and it's not going to be the path that you envisioned, but you, you get your foot in that way. And it was amazing exposure. And in that job as an operations assistant, I would order the credentials through the NFL for the, the crew that we sent to the Super Bowl. And then I would negotiate nice. rates with the hotels in the Super Bowl city. And I would, you know, reserve a space at the convention center for us to do our show from. So it was, it was interacting. It was first of all, I mean, literally like doing Super Bowls and March Madness and NBA All-Star and all, like massive events, massive right. sporting events where you're interfacing with league officials and PR people and teams. So it's a lot of exposure and networking. And then it's also understanding what it takes to put on a big production like that too. Mm-hmm. So it, it was a, it was a lot of knowledge, um, you know, and at the same time, like I'm ordering pens and pencils and installing right. phone lines, like it, you know, right. what it is, but um that was like a great, a great jumping off point. And from operations assistant, I became um, a talent booker on Best Damn Sports Show, which again was a, a yeah. super fun show with a, a lot of interesting people. Yeah. <laughs> people <laughs> to come onto that set. And, um, and then a production manager on that show. And then when that show went off the air, I, I got laid off and I was literally interviewing to do pharmaceutical sales. Oh, wow. um, yeah, I thought it was over. I, I, you know, I, I just, I, I thought that was it. I, it was, I was out of work for almost an entire year. How, how tough was that? I want to stay in this, like, how tough was that yeah. moment right there? Like, did you go through any depression? Cause I could just understand even me and Brian being former football players. Like, I don't care what school you go to. If you play college ball, the goal and the assumption is that, okay, I'm going to the league. Yeah. I didn't make it to the league. I got a knee injury. And even if I didn't get hurt, it was going to be a stretch anyway to even make it. So once my career was over, I there was like a, a, a two year period as well. Where I'm like, man, like, what am I like? What's next? You know what I'm saying? So yeah. like, what was the mindset for you? Um, it was it was tough because I was you know I I had gotten let go from a job which I you know that doesn't feel good. Right. And I was at the time like watching my peers who were climbing the ladders in their own industries right. and they you know my friends that were doing like pharmaceutical sales which when I was in school I didn't even know that was a thing but right. they had a company car they had a company phone they had an expense you know a credit card for expenses and right. like, and they just seemed to be killing it and crushing it and and I was like, I don't know, maybe I'm doing this wrong. Like, you know, I, I kind of had the cool job for all these years and mm-hmm. I, you know, I got to go to the Super Bowl and I got to, you know, go to like big games and, and meet cool people, but I wasn't, I wasn't crushing it. I wasn't getting to where I wanted to be professionally. So I was, I was looking at other options at the time. And um, I had built up enough of a resume tape um, and I had just hired an agent. So I, I was putting feelers out there to, mm-hmm 
you know, get in front of the camera full time. And um, it wasn't until at like it was I, I was out of work for. All right, this is a crazy story. Do you have time for this? Oh, we got yeah. we got yeah. as much time as you got. <laughs> so I, I get let go and I'm out of work 11 months. And my, my friend's father worked at PBS here in Los Angeles. And she's like, listen, my dad is like going to hire you for this entry level job. But at least it gets you in the workforce and, you know, you, you'll get benefits and all that. And I'm like, sure, I'll do it. So I take this job at, at CBS Radford in yeah. Studio City. And it's literally like an entry level job and people are coming by and they're like, are you in high school? Because it was just, it was this really, I, I would answer the phones about <clears throat> it, um, like flooded toilets or like cockroaches or like garbage mm. needs to be picked up on the stage or, or this set, you know, th there's food left over. You have to get that cleared out. And I would, I would write up the work tickets and, and send it out. And meanwhile, I've got at this point, eight years of <laughs> experience in production under right. my belt like at a major network on major shows so but it, it was a, it was not just a step down like it was a few steps down yeah. but i needed to get back out there so i do that and i'm there about three months and my agent calls me and he's like the philadelphia 76ers want to bring you in for an audition I'm like, let's go. So I go, I bring my mom to the interview because I flew to New York and I had her take the train with me to Philly. I did the interview and we took the train back. And I just remember like going like, oh my God, is this going to happen? Like, can this happen? I'm, I, what am I doing with my life? Like at, at the same time, simultaneously, I'm meeting with, I had some friends in the pharmaceutical sales business. I'm shadowing them on their jobs to see what it's like. And I'm, I'm, I'm setting up, like I'm presenting a resume and putting it out there. And I ended up getting that job with the Sixers, which was amazing. And I, you know, here was my big opportunity. And then after the season, um, I come back to LA because the Sixers were like, we're going to bring you back next year. But in the meantime, we already have our, our Eagles and Phillies people and Flyers people. So we don't have any work for you at the moment, but we'll bring you back next basketball season. So I moved back to LA and like three days after I get back into town, I have an audition at cbs radford to be a sports anchor and reporter with jim hill and i'm like what? Oh, i know so it was like six months later like literally i'm answering phones about clogged toilets and roaches and roaches and six months later i come back and i'm sports anchor sports reporter so it That's you know nuts. like it's about seriously it's about perseverance and having you know not being too proud to take a step back and, and, you know, just keep the ball moving forward. You know, that's, that's what I needed to do. Just keep it moving forward and, you know, take a job that was beneath me right. in order to just keep myself out there. And it's just, it's, it's a crazy thing to then six months later, go back and be in that position. So, um, yeah, so it was cool. I'm, I'm, I always look at that as like a, a humbling experience, but you that's, know, and that's, that's some true game, Jamie. And I think the porch, We'll definitely um, have some um, some good gems as far as taking away, you know, that that story, because as far as millennials, you know, just kind of the way the world is moving. We want everything fast. Right. We want to yes. get there. We want to stay there. We want to be there. Um, and a lot of the time, some people don't know what the work looks like yeah. on how to get there, but they just want to get there and um, having some, you know, being persistent and having some humility you know, about, you know, where you are and, you know, where you need to get to, it's okay to take a step back because you know where you want to go. And as long as you continue to, you know, press, press forward, you know, you'll eventually get there. So as far as, you know, your career, uh, as you continue to climb the ladder, what was that defining moment for you? Um, that was like, okay, it clicked. It's like, Hey, I'm off to the races now. Like, this is what <laughs> I do. Like, this is, this is I'm, me. I'm that girl. I'm just, you know what I mean? I'm Jamie Maggio. Like, I'm <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that moment's ever happened. <laughs> I feel like um, I feel super lucky to have had the career that I've had and, and you know, to still be doing it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I definitely that that job with the Sixers felt like a turning point. It felt like that's what because prior to that, I had done stuff for FoxSports.com. Um, mm. And when I was at Best Damn Sports Show, I was the production manager, but they would let me do these interviews with the guests in the green room. Mm -hmm. right. And we would put it on the website. 
So, and it wasn't like I was getting paid for it. It was literally like, I'd be in there like, hey, can you sign this release form? And let me get you into the makeup chair. And before I walk you out to sit, can I ask you a couple of questions? Yeah. So it was like, you know, super Bush League, but it was at the time there was a producer at Best Damn who would sit with me and like go over game film, basically. Mm -hmm. Like after I do the interviews, we'd, we'd talk it through and, you know, talk about technique and what felt good and natural and everything. So, um, but that, 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 that Sixers job sort of was, in my opinion, like what, what turned things around and, and made me like a legit, a legitimate broadcaster. Right, so that, gotcha. that, yeah. So I feel super lucky for that opportunity. So, so obviously, you know, you're a professional, you know, um, one thing I think is cool is obviously you get to meet tons of players, right? Um, tons of influential people, just tons of people that just people around the world would die to just be in the same room with, right? So I guess talk to us a little bit about, I mean, obviously you had to be professional when you were interviewing and things like that. Did you ever have like that wow moment internally where like, mm. like I'm interviewing so-and-so? Oh, as I was interviewing, oh my God. Well, one time I was interviewing Nelly actually. <laughs> Wow. Oh man! Nelly, like it was like when Nelly was at the Air top. Force One, big boy. <laughs> I didn't hear her. Question: I was sitting there, and who who was his girlfriend? Ashanti at the time. Yeah, Ashanti was there, like Ashanti. standing off to the side. I'm like, oh, she's so pretty. And I was okay. just, I'm sitting there I'm doing this interview, and I totally in the middle of the interview, the interview, forgot what I was saying. And I was like, oh, <laughs> so embarrassing. And he was like, what? Did I do something? And I was like, no, no, no. Luckily, it wasn't live. It was taped, but it yeah. was right. one of those. And I was trying to like be slick by not having my questions written down. Mm. But I, cause it was the way that it was shot. We were, it, we were sitting on a couch and it was like a full, um, full body. So I was like, I don't want to have notes with me, but I don't know if I needed those notes. Um, <laughs> but that, I mean, not that I was like starstruck by Nelly. I, I remember being starstruck um, meeting Lawrence Taylor. Cause I'm a giant. Oh, nice. Oh yes. yes. Come on. That's a legend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Legend. Lovely, lovely. He's super cool. But um, that, that was a moment I was like, ah. Oh. And then cool. randomly, I did a story with um, Laird Hamilton and Gabby Reese mm -hmm. a couple years ago. Um, they're doing this whole like fit fitness thing called XPT. It's like a, a style of, of staying in shape and mental stuff. It's, it's really cool. But I'm at their house doing the story. Freaking Pat Riley walks in to like use their pool. He's like going to work what? out in their pool. I swear with Joe Kim Noah. And then it was just like a weird alternate universe. I'm like, what is happening here? And then I'm like, I wanted to go talk to Pat Riley, but he's swimming right now. Like, <laughs> right. He's <laughs> swimming. You're staying outside the pool. Hey, Pat, I got a few questions for you. Yeah, <laughs> you're at a setting like. <laughs> It's different when you're at a game or something. I think yeah, people right. anticipate being approached in that right. environment. But like you're at your friend's backyard using their like fitness setup. I, I didn't think I could do that, but I was like, oh, that's so cool. It's Pat Riley. <laughs> and he's one of the coolest cats in the world, man. So it's like, yeah. man, <laughs> Pat Riley. And those and those 90s Knicks teams, man, that was what made me like love hoops for sure. So yeah, yeah cool. So I Wait, did I answer the question? What was no, the no, question? yeah, absolutely. Nah, you did. <laughs> 100%. He asked, yeah, that wow, yeah, you named a few people. That, that's great. Oh, you know what else was super cool? Um, the first time I was doing the playoffs, like, uh, for TNT, and we were doing, it was a, the Pacers-Bulls series in the first round, and I was working the game with Steve Kerr. Mm. He was the analyst on the game, and we were walking into – um, the Bulls arena and, and he's like saying hello to everybody and like every security guard and you know how's your kids like he, it was amazing and I, I remember walking in going like holy shit I'm I'm doing an NBA playoff game with Steve Kerr in Chicago like I grew up watching Steve Kerr in Chicago in the playoffs like usually beating the Knicks and, and like <laughs> Yeah, it was, that was that was a cool moment for me and it, like just having watched this guy on TV and now I'm I'm his broadcast partner for this game. It, that was a cool. That's one. dope. That's yeah, dope. Yeah, and you're probably rooting against him, obviously. So <laughs> yeah, well, him, him and Reggie, like I'm working with Reggie, I was like, this guy's an asshole. But Reggie, like the best, <laughs> right? But like as a Knicks fan, you right. exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So so those are some fun moments, like as as you become an adult, that yeah. you can look back on and be like, oh, these guys are like like idols from my childhood. And now I get to like be like, what's up? One hundred percent. I know it's probably hard for you, like in the moment, because you're you you're grinding and you're on go mode. So it's hard for you to probably sit back and be and just think and look back over your life and your career and be like, damn, like 
that was pretty cool. You know what I'm saying? Um, but a lot of kids and a lot of people, including myself, some of the people I've met, even being, being able to speak with you right now, growing up and being like, I would have never in a million years thought I would be able to be friends with some of these athletes and communicate and talk and do podcasts with, with some of them. So you're definitely an inspiration, even if you don't even know you're, yeah. if you don't know you are, you are one. So. <laughs> yeah. It's and, fun. Like we, we really are living the dream, you know? Yes. It's beautiful. It's 100%. beautiful. And it's so funny. So like quick story, like, so my, uh, one of my good friends, I told you coach for the jets, they had a game in Indy. So he uh, gave us like some sideline passes just to see pregame and stuff like that. And it was a Thursday night. So the Thursday night NFL network, I guess the analysts were there like Steve Smith, Michael mm -hmm. Irvin. So they were walking on the side on like on the sideline. And like, I was like, man, should I get a picture with Michael Irvin? And like Michael Irvin literally was shoulder to shoulder with me. And I was like, I'm just nervous to ask him for a picture. Like, I don't, I like, I want to take a picture with him. Like I, I'm like, I'm not even going to ask him. So every time I see him on TV, I'm like, I should have just asked that guy for a picture. Like, I don't know why. I didn't ask him for a picture. Worst thing he can say is I'll no. Probably, literally, I mean, I'll probably live with that forever. It's so, it's so funny to think about that. And like, you guys just talk to people every day. Just like, <laughs> Nelly, <laughs> Norris Taylor. Hey, like, it's just cool. So definitely got an appreciation for that. A hundred percent. For sure. So let's move to our quick hitters. I know I know we got to let you go here. Uh, so this some quick hitter questions here. We'll, we'll ask you a question. You give us a one or two liner. Uh, response so okay, okay. obviously you're from new york and i read in one of your bios that you're a pizza enthusiast so yeah what is the best pizza back in new york and then tell me what's the best pizza out here in la uh, okay so <clears throat> in new york there's a spot on long island that there's like there's actually a couple different franchises now but it's called umberto's pizza mm. and first of all you can get a lot of good pizza all over new york but umberto's i make my sister take me there like she picks me up at the airport usually <clears throat> we go straight to umberto's sometimes she even brings a slice in the car because it is just so good it's like mm. the perfect amount of cheese sauce ratio you want the crust to be just the right amount of crunch mm. not too burnt but not not like undercooked and it's just so so good and then i found out like the michael strahan giants they would get this umberto's at the practice facility once a week oh that's mm. nice. i was like oh of course makes sense, uh, makes sense. <laughs> so um my, my favorite place in la i don't know if i can say it publicly because i don't want it to blow up <laughs> <laughs> oh, you gotta at least tell me because i've been looking listen i've been here for about four years i'm still learning la covid made it kind of difficult obviously i have not found a piece of spot yet you gotta help me out all right so i actually i was having a call with a friend who works for the clippers earlier and he's also from the east coast and like mm -hmm. we have this thing where we're gonna once a month take each other to a different pizza spot so that we can find the best pizza but so far i would say it's called Slice and Pint in El Segundo. And this stuff is like, you can write that down. We'll go there, Darnell, we'll go there. Yeah, okay, let's make it happen. It's a, it's a cool, like they've got like the outdoor setup, which I think just started during COVID and you can bring your dog and hang out. But the, the pizza there is really, really good. So mm. yeah, and I, I'm like, I'll never get over pizza. It will always be like, if I had to choose one thing to eat for the rest of my life, I think it's pizza. I can see I can see the love in your eyes as you're as you're saying it like it's, it's just the perfect combination of of ingredients and man simple now now I'm Wait, a you, these are supposed to be quick hitters and I'm just like rambling on about pizza Shh. hey I love it I'm good you talk about pizza all day and I, <laughs> and I just want to add I'm from Chicago so yeah. it's not like a deep dish, deep dish. we got you this place called dish? Italian Fiesta you know we got a couple good spots in Chicago that are just to die for so I'll give you that. And I will say this during, during this COVID experience that we're all going through, I did order some Lou Malnati's. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they were hey. to you at um, like, you know, frozen, these frozen pizzas, mm -hmm. they, they taste great in the oven. Fire. So mm. yeah. I might check it out. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's talk about, obviously um, let's talk about like your DMS and like people that are hitting you up. So <laughs> The funniest. Oh, the now funniest, we're getting we're getting, getting spicy. <laughs> you know, the, the funniest, the funniest thing for me is like obviously you know 
on social media, your followers get to grow. People start to just hit you up out of, out of just kind of the blue with random questions. And obviously you're on TV, you're interviewing people that people love, you're interviewing people that people hate essentially. You're so right. talk to us a little bit about maybe the craziest comment or craziest DM that you got, you know, after maybe interviewing somebody or uh -oh. know, uh, just out of nowhere, I guess. <laughs> You know what? There's <clears throat> social media, as you guys well know, is a weird place. Yes. Um, <laughs> there are people that, you know, one time I, I was doing a, a football game for Fox and I had like bronchitis and a guy was messaging me like, you sound like a man. You look like one, too. Oh um, you know, so there's just we're, we're like, I know you want to give him head after that interview. Like people say crazy, crazy stuff. So I have actually for my own mental health stop. And then there's the other stuff about like, you know, you're so hot. I want to do this too, yeah. like that kind of stuff. So I, I have really taken a step back of looking at the mentions or looking in the DMS just because of that. I think that the, it's just like, <clears throat> it can be such a great way to share information, mm -hmm. right. but especially like, you know, in this whole like last presidential campaign, I won't get too nutty, but like <laughs> people have, really use social media in like bizarre unfortunate ways and i and i I've, you know i don't think we can live without it but i think we have to alter how we live with it mm. and for me that is being less concerned about the comment section and less concerned about the mentions and, the, and people's opinions of me or what i do because you're never going to please everybody so um, you know, there, there's been all kinds of crazy stuff over the years, but I, I sort of try to filter that out. Yeah. And also, guys, no girl likes a dick pic. Just <laughs> put that out there. It's not a single female that is like, oh yeah, that's hot. Don't do it. It's not good. Don't do it. Don't they sending you dick pics in a DM. Oh, what are we thinking, fellas? What yeah. are we thinking? One That's guy crazy. put it next to a Glade can, a spray can to show like size. I was like. That could be travel size. We don't know. hundred percent. A hundred percent. Oh my God. Listen, man, if you want to listen, I don't know your relationship status. I don't know if you're single or not, but if, if you are and men, that's not the way to shoot your shot. Don't send yeah, a dick pic. That's not going to work. It's not going to, you know, maybe you'll see her out getting some pizza and that's the proper time to talk to her, but don't hit the DMs up, man. <laughs> Got you. Anyway. Now, uh, I got one more for you. Uh, so I saw in college you joined a sorority. Now, I don't want to say it wrong. Is it is it Pi Beta Five? Am I saying it right? Pi Five, for sure. But yeah, Pi Five. five. Now, listen, we on the porch, man. We got to keep it real. What's the wildest thing that you can tell us on the porch <laughs> that you and your sorority sisters did in college? This is a no judgment. This is a free. Listen, we've all been there. I know me and Bolo turned up at Ball State for sure. Um, Fair with it. You know what? If this is a, I don't want to end on like a lame note, but it wasn't it wasn't <laughs> that crazy. But you know, we did a lot of um, like theme parties where you would dress up. Um, you know, which nowadays probably people would would be you know like think that it's inappropriate. But you know, like what what do we do? Like white trash, you know, party or right, like, right. Eskimos and ski hose or stuff like, <laughs> stuff like stupid stuff like that. Um, yeah. But everything was like a dress up party. So at that time, I had mm. an extensive collection of like feather boas and tassels and, you know, just like weird stuff that you that you might need for a, one of these dress up parties. But no, it was, it was actually pretty tame. And I will say that, you know, people that weren't in the Greek system would kind of cr criticize it. Like, I don't need to mm. play for my friends. But right. to this to this day, some of my best girlfriends are the girls that I was in college with. And, and it wasn't like we did this weird stuff in a sorority that, you know, this hazing or, um, you know, it was just, a, it was a good group of people that you had, you know, community with. So right. that, that that's what it was, was a community. And it was, it was a nice thing. So it wasn't, it wasn't anything crazy. I mean, I did beer bong. I was really good at it. I'll just say that, but. Okay. Yeah, you go to the hardware store, you buy a funnel and a tube. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Crazy. Well, shoot. Was, <laughs> well, this is no sorority related thing, but my first my first party in college, uh -oh. I was like, I'm in college now. Like, I've got to do certain things. Santa Barbara was a party school. So I remember I took a rip from like a six foot bong 
and I thought I, I thought I was dying. I like <laughs> went, and I, all right, and the kids don't try this at home, but it is legal now. It was. It is. It is. So yeah. Right. 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 Tweet your own. Yeah, it was it was not good because I was very inexperienced with it, and I you know, should have known that a six foot bong would be something that. Woo! That just made me just kind of fix my posture just a little bit. Yeah, yeah I don't think real. my lungs have ever covered yet. Right, you still got to <laughs> clear the throat a little bit. <laughs> nah, I is love that, it. Is that to, is that safe to say on the porch? Should we allow? Oh it? no, oh, we yeah, absolutely. Look, we, we go the there. Okay, yeah, we 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 definitely go. there. A couple weeks ago, we had uh we had. Lisa Ann on as a guest yeah. who I, I did. I looked at some of your guests. I don't know how I, I measure up to these these <laughs> ladies that have uh more oh now you Jamie life. Maggio. Stop playing. Yeah, Jamie Maggio. You, you're so humble and I appreciate that about <laughs> you. But come on now. Don't show yourself short. Yeah. So, so before we let you go, I have yeah. to ask, and I know our listeners probably will want to know. You've seen thousands of games. Tell yeah. me a, about your favorite game or like the favorite, Ooh. your 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 I guess the best game that you've been a part of. Oh my God. So it was um, the Super Bowl, Giants Patriots, Ooh. the first, first time around. Um, it was a Fox Super Bowl and I was working at Best Damn Sports Show. So mm -hmm. production manager. So I was in um, Arizona for the game and just being around the environment. And like, we, you know, we had Tom Coughlin on. I love Tom Coughlin. We, yeah. you know, all having those Giants players on Patriots as well. And, and you're just being there at Super Bowl is such an exciting event. Um, mm -hmm. I think March Madness is the only thing that that kind of rivals that experience. Um, but I ended up going to the game. I had one ticket up in the nosebleeds by myself. I went up there and I was like, I can't sit up here by myself. I, I went down to a lower level and I found some Giants fans, like random people. And we were all huddling together. And I remember watching that game and the catch, like David Tyree, you yeah. couldn't, you, I, it, when it happened, I was like, I couldn't appreciate how insane that was right. because you're, you're watching it instead of seeing it on the TV with all these different angles. Like, you know, I think they showed the replay on, on the Jumbotron or whatever, mm. but like you couldn't fully appreciate it. And that game, I just like, I was crying. I, I cried for at least a week after anytime I heard an interview on the, or like, a, you know, a replay or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, and I will say Fox sports, they had the game that year. And after the super bowl, after that game, they had a rap party and mm -hmm. at the rap party, they replayed the game on these giant screens all over. And I was just, mm -hmm. it was just in heaven. That was, that was so special to be able to see my team beat the previously undefeated Patriots, the evil empire, like the, the New York <laughs> of football. Right. Yeah. And it, that, that was like the most unbelievable. And I thought like, man, I am so lucky to be here in this spot where I can like, you know, just be a part of it, soak it up a little bit. And uh, yeah, that, that was probably the best game ever. That's amazing. It was a long time ago, man. I know, I know. I remember it like it was yesterday. You know, that was one of those memorable moments. Oh, yeah. I was just like, and we were all rooting for the Giants. Like, I don't care who you're crazy. a fan of. The whole drive was crazy. Yeah. 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 Me being a Colts fan forever, like I hate the Patriots. So I was so happy. I was a Giants fan that day. So <laughs> Thank you. definitely appreciate it. So, but Jamie, man, like we always say, uh, we got to you know give our flowers to you. You are doing amazing work. Um, you. you know, continue grinding and leading the way and inspiring others. You know, I'm early in my career. I'm still learning and navigating through this space and having someone like you to, to watch and, and, you know, be able to ask questions if needed. It's definitely a huge, you know, uh, appreciation for sure. So continue to shine and we appreciate you. Well, let me express my gratitude to both of you for making this uh, such a fun interview and for, for having me on to uh, be on your podcast. So this is a lot of fun. Thank you guys. Of course, of course. Absolutely. Where can the people find you real, real quick? Like social media, you know, where can they find Jamie? Uh, uh, let me look. I'm on Instagram. I, I don't really mess with Twitter anymore. I mean, I go on there on a regular basis, but um, at Jamie underscore Maggio. And that's Jamie like Jaime. Everyone spells it wrong. J-A-I-M-E. There you go. Y'all heard it here first, man. Don't Bolo, close us out. Hey, <laughs> we appreciate Jamie for blessing the porch. Um, I'm your boy B. Jones, a.k.a. Bolo. This is my boy D. Nail. Hey, patience, being persistent, and being professional. Hey, you put those in the pot, Hey, who knows where you'll end up? Somewhere successful. We rocking with y'all. We love y'all. We appreciate y'all. Please follow us, Deep Porch Podcast underscore. 
crazy episode dropping. We out. Y'all have a good night. Happy New Year. <laughs> Peace. That was where it all began. Had to put in work every day. We got it in. We chased all our dreams and now they can't believe it. We make it look easy. We achieving everything we need. Now we undefeated. If we link, no, it's only business. If we get to speaking, leave them speechless. I did things for free, but now it costs.